Hi, everybody. Good evening. Just wait for everyone to arrive. Great, I think that's it then. Welcome to Embercoom Online. Thank you for joining us um, on this Wednesday evening, afternoon or morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, tonight, we are going to be going into the depths of the cave, a place deep in the earth where our ancestors used to go to hear the voices of the other world. And we're really lucky to have with us tonight Daniel Allison from the Scottish Gaelic tradition and Angarid Wynne from the Welsh Pythonic tradition to talk about their understanding of the other world and the cave and portals that we can use to hear otherworldly voices. So um, how we will do it is um, have a discussion for about 20 minutes and then Daniel and Angarid will tell us a story from each of their traditions and then we should have about 20 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So um, it is probably better if you have a question to save it until then rather than putting it in the chat to begin with just so that we can be sure that we manage to see them all. And yes, uh, we hope to finish at eight and have a lovely evening, everybody. So I'm going to start with you, Daniel. Um, from your Scottish tradition, can you tell us uh, what your understanding of the other world is? Mm, yeah, good question. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, the Scottish tradition is quite different to other Celtic traditions, other traditions from within the British Isles. In Wales and in Ireland, you had monks recording pagan stories for posterity, even though they didn't believe in them. Uh, they felt they should record some of them, even though they did change them quite a bit. Um, as we'll see if we read the great surviving cycles from Ireland, uh, the Ulster cycle or the mythological cycle or uh, the Mabinogion, which uh, Angharat will speak about. We didn't get that in Scotland. Uh, there was no recording of these cycles. So there's 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 less stuff there. There's less stuff to go on. And but what's interesting is that the stories which we do have, which are more tend more towards being folk tales than being myths or you know obvious stories of gods. If you look closely, you can kind of learn to read them and can learn to see they do contain teachings about the other world, almost as if the gods and the, the beings that occupied the great mythic stories kind of burrowed down into legends and into folk tales, which may seem like entertainment and may seem inconsequential. But once you learn to look at them, they're, they're not so much. So what we, what we can learn once we start to look at the stories in this way, uh, so to take a couple of stories, for example, there's stories like the makers of dreams, which I'm going to tell uh, later on, in which a girl goes out in the mountains, gets lost, and she ends up sitting by this pool in a cave, gazing into this pool, the pool of knowledge. And this is clearly a magical initiatory experience. We have also the story of Finn McCool and the Salmon of Knowledge, um, which is a shared story between Scotland and Ireland, in which Finn, as a, as a boy, as a teenager, he goes and sits with this old poet Finnegas, who's been sitting for years uncounted by this pool where the Salmon of Knowledge swims, hoping to catch it and gain wisdom. So it doesn't take too much to look at these stories and see that our ancestors in, in Scotland believed that knowledge could be accessed through water and through a long period of stillness and listening. There are other stories, uh, many Fianna stories, stories of Finn McCool and the Fianna who are warriors that guarded the shores of Scotland and Ireland. Many of those stories involve them going out into the forest, going out hunting, and they're off, they go off, they're going fast through the forest, and then they're in the, they're just in the other world. And this strange man comes along and invites them into his little house. And through there, they go through all these testings and they come out changed. And this, these are really similar if you read, 
accounts of shamanic journeys um, by Siberian shamans that are really, really similar. Um, so we can see like um, connection to water, uh, connection moving through the forest into liminal spaces. These are ways of accessing the other world. And then what happens there? Stories always speak in quite a coded language. You know, it's never really spelled out exactly for you. Um, so at this point, it for me, it's often a case of learning to listen to the story, engage with the story, perhaps through creativity, perhaps through meditation, seeing what's saying to you individually. Uh, or it's a case of actually going out and doing the same thing, go out um, to a body of water, spend some time silently in nature and see what speaks to you. Do you have anything specific? I mean, you mentioned caves there, Daniel, and we're kind of um, really interested in the whole cave and within the earth. Are there, are there um, stories that contain caves particularly? Yes, yeah, so the story that I mentioned that I'm going to tell tonight, the Makers of Dreams, uh, this one particularly involves a girl who goes up into the Cullen Mountains in Sky, which some of you have might been to, and she gets lost. These, uh, I don't want to give away too much, but she ends up uh, in a cave, and her whole this long period is spent in a cave, uh, gazing into a pool, and. Again, it's one of those things, it's, it's not too much is told about how exactly she accesses knowledge. And I feel like if I say any more, I'm just going to be <laughs> I'm going to ruin the story. So I don't want to say any more about that story. In terms of many other stories involving caves, there's um, Irish stories that are coming to mind. Um, Dermot and Grania share in uh, shelter in caves when they're on the run together. Um, there's this, there's a series of caves in Cesh Corin in Ireland. Uh, where these uh, the fairy folk live, and um, yeah, quite quite often there will be an entrance into the into the other world through a cave, and this might involve going to meet the fairies or meet the selkies, the seal people, or uh, the fin folk. If we're talking about Shetland and Orkney, and these tend to be places where you will find seal people gathered, you will find uh, trowies, which are like troll people gathered and um, having a wedding, which a fiddler will be brought there uh, to dance in. And yeah, this leads us to an interesting point actually, is that for me, M Martin Shaw, for example, makes this um, distinction between pastoral and prophetic stories. Pastoral stories being reassuring stories, a bit of entertainment that kind of reinforces the social norms or well, prophetic stories are ones which light a fire under you, um, disrupt things, and maybe send your life off in a different direction. For me, these stories in which someone goes, uh, perhaps a musician is meet some fairies and ask them to come at their play at their wedding, very typical um, Scottish story, that m the person comes back and they may be able to play some fairy music, but they're changed, they're different, they're kind of set apart from other people. So there's a kind of double speak here, like for some people you hear that story and that's going to say, well, I wouldn't want that. You know, I'm, I'm going to make sure I'm not going to go wandering off with any fairies should I meet them on the road at night. Other people might get a sense in this of, yeah, actually, I would be quite happy to exchange some comfort and uh, having family and friends um, for a great artistic gift or the ability to be a great smith or the gift of prophecy. So the stories perhaps tell us, yeah, you if you go into these places and you encounter these energies, these beings, you may be changed and just be aware of how far that can go. It's not just something you can pick up and put down. If you go into far into the other world, you have these initiatory experiences that may change you for good. And, and, and from the stories that are available fragments i'm imagining from your tradition um going back in time is there enough information to give us a kind of um i was going to say a protocol which is exactly the wrong word uh, enough n ways of knowing how to do this and where to go and what should we be doing when we get there and practices i mean is there much you can glean from the stories themselves Hmm. I think, um, so Angherd uh, is go going to talk about the Mabinogion, um, which I know sh she views as 
kind of mag in some of them at least as magical teaching stories which do really or do exist uh, on one level to offer direction uh, on these matters we don't have stories which seem to me to be so clearly uh, performing that function but to me you know that that can be a source of grief and it, it is a source of grief for many people I, th I think you know that we have lost so much in our tradition but there is a there is a benefit to that too which is that yes our, our tradition is really fragmented but that means if we want to engage with it we've got to be creative we've got to meet it with our full self we can't there's the option of just dogmatically adhering tradition and doing what our ancestor did because that's what they did that's just not on the table with with scottish tradition we have to approach it and find our own way into the stories and find our own way to meeting finn or meeting asipatl so whether that's through artistic practice and um, it might be you know telling a story through uh, writing through drawing through painting some whatever it is you'll do or it might be through meditation going out finding a cave up in the north of Scotland, uh, finding, going out into the forest, wherever it is you are, and and spending time in silence, you know, kind of reenacting the story. And there are so many ways uh, to do that, which uh, Angharad um, can share a lot about, I think. So that for me is you know, the, the sad thing about our tradition and the really, really exciting thing. So just before we move to Angarid, have you could you recommend a source of um, Gaelic stories that kind of, if if people want to go away and research it a bit, what would you recommend they read? Well, I'd recommend my book. I think oh, okay. <laughs> I would too. Do you want like, to just say what it is, Daniel? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've got a, a collection called Scottish Myths and Legends, uh, which is, uh, I hope, is an ideal primer on Scottish stories. Um, there's lots of links there to other sto storytellers I've learned from and other books and sources and so on. I've also got a book called Finn and the Fianna, uh, which is the cycle of Finn McCool's stories that I mentioned. The Salmon of Wisdom is in there. And also a book called The Shattering Sea, which is based on the story from Orkney of Asipatl and the Great Sea Serpent, but turning that into a whole uh, Iron Age fantasy. Uh, that's my way of, my chief way of engaging with these stories is to go really deeply into creating new stories out of them. So that's that's one that's very dear to me. So there's all of them. And there's also, I've got this podcast, uh, House of Legends. So there's all kinds of stories on there that you can listen to for free. Fantastic. Thanks, Daniel. And Garrod, the Welsh tradition, the other world, caves, magical reenactments. Yes, good evening, everyone. I'm sorry, I seem to be having a little bit of disturbance in my Wi-Fi tonight. <clears throat> if it gets too bad, I'll turn my, my camera off um, and you'll be none the poorer um, for that. Um, the cave in the Brythonic tradition. So just to explain the Brythonic tradition, that means Britonic, meaning Britain south of kind of the, the um, I suppose, Hadrian's Wall. So it has been kept alive in the Welsh tradition, in Welsh manuscripts, only because uh, Welsh is the descendant of the British language that we all would have spoken here in the, in the British Isles, uh, other than kind of north of Hadrian's Wall um, and over in Ireland uh, until the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons. So the, when, I, when, when we're talking about kind of the Welsh material, it is the matter of Britain. It is the, the only kind of ancient law that we have that much, much of it predates kind of Christianity, that its roots can, can be traced back as, as far about the Bronze Age. Um, and really, when I'm looking at my tradition, I'm looking at a number of sources. I'm looking at the archaeology that is around in the British Isles and what that can kind of point us towards and what archaeologists are interpreting that, because unfortunately, archaeology can't tell us what people believed. They can sometimes give us hints as to practices. And I'm looking at the ancient myths of the Mabinogion and, and others um that are kind of in what we call the matter of britain and i'm looking at the ancient poetry of britain and we have uh, a number of poets and i'd like to probably to start with one of these taliesin i'm sure some of you will have 
heard the story of the birth of Talia. It's a very magical story. And um, in the story, he's born three times. He's born to an earth mother once. He's born through the cauldron of inspiration, three drops of inspiration. And then he is swallowed by the great goddess Caridwen and is, is birthed and then is put into a leather bag set on an ocean and on the summer seas in some versions on some it's a river and the bag is slit open by elfin and out he comes and he's a fully fledged bard filled with wisdom with a bright brown that's what taliesin means now the reason i'm telling you that story in in brief is because it is believed that within that story are the rudiments of an ancient ritual tradition of the final making of a bard. Taliesin was a historic poet. He sings, we call it singing in Welsh, in the sixth century. But magically, we have his poetry through till the 12th century. He still, still seems to be alive and well and creating new poetry in the 12th century, which just isn't possible by any kind of rational means. But what we now understand, and the same thing happens with other bards like Taliesin and Talheyarn as well, is that the, initiate, the initiatory process for the final bit of becoming a bard was to be sealed in a dark cave or a space. Now we have cromlechs, uh, burial chambers, all across Britain. Many of them have something of the poet stone or minor barth is one in, in Wales or bath Taliesin, Taliesin's grave. And these are places that we believe that poets were put in and sealed in. Often in the Irish tradition, there is an equivalent where they will put a heavy stone or a burden on their chest as well. And they were locked, kind of put in darkness for about three days. And when they were brought out of that darkness, they were meant to channel poetry in the voice of one of the great bards. And so if you were going into Taliesin's grave, the idea was that you would come out and speak poetry, kind of Taliesin's poetry, you would channel his poetry. If it was Beda Neirin, the same would be true of Aneirin. And so those poets, poems that were created following these kind of final bardic initiatory processes were attributed not to the initiatory bard but to the bard that was being channeled and hence we have poetry of Taliesin from the 6th century from when he was actually alive through to the 12th century. But before then um, there is an earlier tradition that's hinted at through archaeology of listening deeply to the ancestors within these burial chambers. I'm going to take you to Anglesey very briefly, and some of you will know a beautiful burial chamber called Barclodia de Gaures. It's like a pregnant belly in the landscape with one channel going into it, into where um, defleshed bones of local ancestors would have been selected. Not all the ancestors went in there, only some. They would have been put in there, and at midwinter, the sun goes up through the channel and illuminates that chamber. Now there's plenty of evidence, not just there, but in, in other places, that the, that the living were going in and interacting with the dead in these places. It's very rare to find a full skeleton. And very often what you'll find is the skull of one skeleton is in with the body of another and the, an odd femur has gone to the other chamber. So there's usually two or three chambers within these places. And they're often designed as ritual spaces. And we know that the fires and feasting would happen there. And it's also possible that young people from the tribe would go in to bring forth the next generation within these places of death and rebirth. Now, what makes one of the things, many things make Barclodia de Gaures particularly interesting, but Barclodia de Gaures bucks the archaeological tradition in that it started off as a stone circle. Usually burial chambers happen first, and then when we get towards the Bronze Age, um, uh, stone, stone circles start to appear, but they adopted the stone circle here early 
in this part of Anglesey, but for some reason it wasn't working out for them. And they took the stone circle down, they used the bank and ditch, and they used the stones to make a burial chamber for the ancestors, going back to an older tradition of listening and communing with the ancestors. And the final thing that they did before they put the mound of earth over the burial chamber back in the Neolithic was they buried the smallest bone in the human body, which is a bone from the inner ear, one of the labyrinth bones. It looks like a little, little hammer. And they, they buried that in the center of the mound and they covered it with earth, built a ritual fire over it, let it go down, and then laid a very special stone that had intricate carvings of kind of, looks like kind of just snakes. They're not like snakes, they're just wiggly waggly patterns. And they laid that on top of it and then laid tons and tons and tons of earth to make this great pregnant belly. And it's possible that this was a way of saying that this is a place you come to commune with the ancestors and to listen deeply to the ancestors, to those who've gone before, their wisdom and the earth itself. And interestingly, um, when archaeologists from about the 1960s onwards, um, following the development, you know, the growth of, of drugs culture and experimenting with mind altering substances, archaeologists have begun to reinterpret some of these kind of what they now think are called phosphenes, these zigzag patterns that you often get in burial chambers and on some really early um, Neolithic and Mesolithic uh, ritual objects. There's a, a jawbone from Kendrick's Cave in north of Wales, and it has these zigzags on them too. And burial chambers like um, Barclodia de Gaures also have these diamonds and zigzags. And they believe now that these, uh, what they're now thinking are these um, phosphenes are showing us the gateway to trance or the gateway to extraordinary experience in some way. Uh, whether that was using plant medicine or whether that was using other ways. What comes down to us when we look at kind of entering into the other world and we have a very specific name for the other world uh, in the Brythonic tradition, it's called Anoven. And Anoven is made up of two bits of words in the Welsh language. An, which means extremely or very, and oven, which comes from doven, which is depth. So it's the extreme depth or the very depth or the inner depth, even the inner deep. And Anoven in the old stories and in the um, in the poetry is described as a dimension that is interacting with us all the time. It's all around us. And it's entered kind of as portals in specific places. Some of the stories tell us of lakes in particular, a lot of association with entering and through lakes, which may be why the Celts, um, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, why they would sacrifice into water, because it was a way of getting straight to speak to the gods, to kind of, to make offerings to the gods in Anoven. But the other way is through song and story, acts of creativity, dance. And these things, if you talk, a friend of mine is actually, he's got the, this amazing, um, a, a amazing job. He's the professor of extraordinary human experience. And he studies um, what they call flow. Now flow for us is a, a state that we will all have encountered. It's that state that you go into when you're driving along no music's on necessarily and suddenly you've gone about 50 miles and you're not quite sure what's happened but you've been away with the fairies but perfectly safe driving the same happens if you're painting if you're quite a good artist and you're sketching or painting or doing any other craft activity that you're pretty good at 
but there's a little bit of challenge. Those are the things you need to be pretty good at it. It needs to be relatively easy, but there has to be a little bit of challenge. So part of your brain is awake. And that is kind of a form of trance, a form of early trance. And that is kind of what kind of, when the poetry is talking about singing, and uh, singing in particular, but acts of poetry, it's all these things that get us out of the way of ourselves, essentially. And they are the gateways, they are gateways into our novel. Does that answer the question, Rachel? Yeah, wonderful. And we could go on for ages, Anne Garrett. And you also told me that at half past you wanted to tell stories. Yeah. So I will move on to the stories. Then I'm sure other people will have questions rather than mine. So um, thank you so much. It does answer the question. Daniel, do you want to go first with your story? Sure. Uh, well, I'll tell the story I did my best to ruin earlier. I'll just get on and tell it. Uh, I'll tell you the story of the makers of dreams. So one morning, one crisp, bright autumn morning, long ago on sky, the island of shadows and mist, a group of girls set off from their village, baskets in hand to go blabbery picking. They walked down through the fields, they walked over the moors and they joked and talked and laughed. And there was one girl among them who had brighter eyes, a wider smile, a louder song, and who just seemed to laugh more loudly, to feel more fully. And when she got there, when she got to the hills, they were going to be looking for their blaberries. She forgot the laughter of her friends. She forgot the jokes. She forgot the singing. She hunkered down and she looked around and she seemed to become a hunting wolf as she searched for the blaberries. So she looked, she looked and there was one and she looked and looked and there was another. And her friends were a distant, distant memory now. She was in a flow state, you know, she was just looking for those berries and there was one and there was another and there was another and there was another. And then her basket was almost full and she looked around her and she was in trouble. She had been so intent, so intent on finding the crispest, sharpest, juiciest berries that she had left her friends far behind her. She had left the hills far behind her and she had gone up, 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 up into the Cullen Mountains. Now the Cullen Mountains and sky are treacherous even today. Compasses don't work up there. Very easy to get lost. And back then, everyone knew a hundred and a hundred more stories of the great beasts, the boars, the wolves of the mountains. So she was terrified. She stood there looking around at those mountains at the edge of the sea, thinking, oh, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. And then right at that moment, right in one moment, a mist, a har, whoosh, blew in from the sea. And it was all around her, so thick you could have sliced it. So she couldn't see a foot this way or that way or that way or that way. And what well, well, she could she do? She couldn't go walking off into the heart because the columns were full of ledges and she could oh, down to her death. So she just stood there, getting colder. And then she heard these sounds. She heard, uh, uh, and she thought of all those stories, all those stories of the witches and strange and terrible beasts of the mountains she heard, she trembled, and then spectral faces appeared out of the mist and she laughed. For it was not giants, it was not witches, it was not gruesome beasts, it was deer, deer, gathered around her, a group of hinds gathered around her and they sniffed at her and they butted over their heads and they looked at her as if to say, well, what are you doing here? And well, she looked at them and then they looked about. They, they as if they'd all heard some voice that she could not hear herself. And then they all set off. The deer set off in a particular direction down this little path that she could just make out. And as they went that way, they were all looking back to her like, are you coming? So what could she do but go with them? So she went with them. They made their way sure-footed through the mountains. 
on and on and up and up and on and up and on and on and up until finally, finally, the mists cleared and as the sun set, they led her into a little glen, a little valley hidden in the high heart of the mountains. And it was the most beautiful glen she had ever seen. Little waterfalls tumbling down among jagged rocks, little streams crisscrossing marshy meadows full of flowers. And the deer made their way across the meadow and she followed them and at the edge of the valley they saw this little cave. And she looked inside and saw there an old man and an old woman. Fire close by and they were both staring into a pool, sitting on rock seats. And they were not old, they were ancient, as ancient as the mountains themselves, it seemed. In went the lead hind. She spoke in some strange animal tongue to the old woman. And the old woman nodded. And then looked up, saw the girl, stared at her. And up she got and she her pulled over. And she said to the girl, what are you doing here? And so the girl told us her story, the story you just heard and explained how she'd been out picking blaeberries with her friends and she got lost and the deer come along and she, she held out her basket of berries and, and said, oh, would you like some and uh, can I stay here for the night? Hmm. The old woman, back to the old man, comes back to the girl. No, you may not stay here a night. A year and a night. You may stay. I am old. My work wearies me. Help me with it. Earn your place by our fire. And to that, the girl agreed. So she stayed with the old man and the old woman, learning their ways. Every day, the old woman would go out into the meadow with a bucket and a stool. She'd sit down there, bucket in front of her, and the deer would come lying up in front of her. And she would milk the deer, fill the bucket with deer milk, and then pick herbs to scatter over the top, and then come back into the cave and heat that bucket over the fire to make crowdy, a kind of sharp cheese, which they still eat up in the highlands. And then give that bucket crowdy to the old man who sat day and night gazing into that pool. And he would look into the pool and he would fashion shapes out of that crowdy. And eventually, after I don't know how many days or weeks, the girl said to the old woman, What is that stuff that he, those things he makes with out of the bucket? And the old woman said, Dreams. What's in that pool? That is the pool of life. We are the makers of dreams. So every evening, the old man would get up and he'd carry that bucket of dreams made of cheese out to this rocky buttress overlooking the Western Ocean. And there, as the sun scattered gold over the mountains, he would reach into his bucket and hold up dreams one by one. And in his left hand, in his left hand, he would hold up dreams of joy, dreams of hope, dreams of brotherhood, and eagles and falcons and wrens would come swooping down, snatch them up and carry them away to plant them in sleeping mines the world over. And in his right hand, in his right hand, he would hold up dreams of jealousy, hatred, envy and deceit. And crows and kites and birds of the battlefield would come swooping down, snatch them up, take them away, plant them in mines, a dark harvest they would wait to reap. After a year and a night, the old woman said to the girl, time for you to go. Your reward awaits you. And she was sad to leave. She'd enjoyed her time there. She'd grown fond of the old man and woman. She'd grown fond of the time she would sit at night, staring into the pool. Even the dark things she saw there, and of course the bright things she saw there too. But down she went, led by the deer, down, 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 until she came to the shore. The sun was setting again, and she made ready to leave and say goodbye to the deer. But they crowded around her, looking out to sea, and she looked out to sea, and she saw a boat 
coming in over the water, a little coracle, a skin boat, a man in it. He got out, he walked up to her. She saw a golden torque around his neck, which showed that he was a prince. And in the way of stories, they fell in love in an instant. And he said, I have dreamed of you. In my father's halls in Tirnanog landed the ever young over the sea further out, more west and west. I've dreamed of you every night, dreamed of you sitting by the pool of life, sitting with the makers of dreams. And now I ask you to come with me to Tirnanog, be my bride and teach us the meanings of dreams. And she went with him. She did kind of want to go home and see, see some people, you know, family, friends, but she'd learnt wisdom up there in the cave. She knew that her destiny lay over the waves. So she went with him farther west and west over the sea to Tirnanog. She lives with her now. She lives there now and she will live there until the end of days. And that's the story of the makers of dreams. Thank you, Daniel. That was wonderful. You didn't ruin it earlier either. <laughs> and Garrod. Fantastic, Daniel. Thank you. I don't know if you want to unpack any of that now while it's fresh. Is there anything to say? Um, I think it, uh, I feel like it'd be good to get on to your story. And then when we have questions and so on, we can talk, go a bit back and forth between this and your story. OK. Fine. So my story is the very opening of the very first story of the body of stories that we know as the Mabinogion. So the Mabinogion were written down in kind of early Middle Welsh in around the, the 12th century, but their roots and origins come from, from some folklorists have, have looked at it and, and mythologists and say it goes back to possibly as far as, if not even further than the Bronze Age. And what we have amongst other things, you know, they have these stories have many functions, but there's certainly aspects of them which seem to be old magical or possibly druidic teaching stories, because there's a lot about the ethics of Them. And there's a lot about proper interaction with Anurvan and the shining beings of Anurvan, so the other world, how as, as mortals we should interact properly, um, and also, you know, how we go in and out, the consequences of getting things wrong in that relationship, and the consequences of getting things right. And I think that the beginning of this story listen to it it's a, it's it's a fantastic beginning to a whole series of stories but it's very very telling because Puil the character who is prince of David and the seven cantrevs of David he has an urge to go to the woods and one of the things that in the tradition around Anurvan and kind of entering the other world that is there in the Brythonic tradition is this sense that we are called to it in some way. One day we have an urge and the adventure and the story and the interaction begins. And I'm sure merely the fact that you're all on this call tonight means that somewhere along the line, you've heard that call and have had that urge. And it goes like this. Puich was Lord over the seven cantrevs of David. And once upon a time, it came into his head and into his hearts to go into the woods of Glyn Keech. He and his men set to the hunt, he unleashed his hounds and blew his horns and off they went after the dogs and he became separated from his companions. He followed his hounds to a clearing in the woods where a deer had been brought down by a pack of white pelted gleaming hounds with red ears. Puig came to the dogs and drove them off their kill and set his own hounds upon it. And it was only then that he saw another hunter sitting upon a gleaming white horse, watching him from the shade of a great oak tree. 
This man urged his horse forward, addressing Poich. Rarely, he said, have I seen such discourtesy in a man than to drive away the hounds that killed a deer and feed his own pack upon it. And Poich, recognising at last the red-eared, white pelted hounds of Anurn, and that he was in the presence of Araun, Lord of the Otherworld, Lord of Anurn, and he saw the error of his ways. Lord, he said, I've done wrong. How may I make amends? And so Araun extracted a pledge from him, and it was this. I will put you in my place in Anurn for a year and a day and give you the most beautiful woman you have ever seen to sleep with you every night. You will wear my face and form so that no chamberlain, no officer, nor any person who has ever served me shall know that you are not me. A year from tonight, on Midsummer's Eve, you will meet a man called Havgan who is my mortal enemy at this ford, and give him just one blow. He will not survive it, and although he will beg you for another, you must not. And that is how you may make amends and reclaim my friendship. And so it was, and they stood at the edge of the river Kich, gazing at each other's reflections in the water, and Puich stepped into Araun's reflection and in doing so crossed into Anurn, while Araun scooped up Puich's form and face from the surface of the pool, washed it over himself, mounted Puich's horse and off he rode to the Llis at Arberth to take up the governing of David for the coming year in Puich's form. Back in Anurn, the other world, Puich found his way to Araun's court and it was the mag most magnificent hall he'd ever seen. He stepped into the hall and was welcomed by the chamberlain and a feast prepared. And in all the stories that ever talk about the other world, there's always a lot of feasts. And at that feast, the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen, dressed from head to toe in gossamer golden silk, sat next to him. And this was Araun's queen. And not only was she beautiful, but her conversation was the most entertaining and engaging he'd ever had. And that night, after a golden feast dripping in mead and candlelight, he followed her to their chamber and she lay naked in the great bed. And he got in and lay naked next to her, desiring her above all things. And then he kissed her good night and turned his back to her. Day after day, he spent his days hunting, governing Anovn as best he knew how, feasting and carousing and delighting in the Queen's company. By day, there was gentle tenderness between them, engaging conversation and affection, but by night, for a whole year, when they lay in bed together, Puich, in Araun's form, would kiss her goodnight and turn away from her to sleep. Days became weeks and weeks became months and soon a whole year had passed and it was Midsummer's Eve. And so at the appointed time, Puich rode back to the ford at the river Kich and there was a mighty warrior full of summer pride. It was Havgan. The two mounted lords approached each other towards the middle of the ford of Glyn Kich, and Puich, in Aran's form, struck the first blow. It was a mighty slash with his battle axe on the centre of Havgan's shield, splitting it in half, shattering his armour and throwing Havgan the spear's length over the crupper of his horse to the ground. Lord, said Havgan, what right do you to my death? There's no reason for you to kill me, but for pity's sake, since you've begun, then finish the task. Lord, said Puich in Araun's form, 
I may regret doing what I've done, but find someone else who will strike you a killing blow, for I will not. So then Havgan called upon his companions to bear him away, knowing for certain that death would come. And those left knelt and swore allegiance to Puig in Araun's form as undisputed Lord of Anul. And then Puig's horse it just stepped backwards and it touched its fetlock to the far shore of the river Kich. And suddenly they were back in this world. And there was Araun sitting astride Puig's old horse, smiling. And it's because of the restraint and the integrity with which Puig had conducted himself in Anurn with Araun's queen, as much as the service he had done in killing Havgan, that Araun honoured him and gave him the name of Puig, Lord of the Seven Cantrevs of David and of Anurn. And they became firm friends and allies, and Puig ruled over the Seven Cantrevs of David well, with the support of all those shining ones of Anurn and received many gifts, including the goddess Rhiannon to wife. But that's another story for another time. So just to say, as well as that call to action, we can see in that story, and it happens time and time again in these stories, is that entering into Anurn and having dealings with Anno, Anurn changes you. It's a place where you go to grow your soul and your spirit. It's a, it's a, it's a, a way of, it's an initiation in itself and you come back changed and either bring back with you gifts or if you get it wrong, bring about kind of all sorts of calamities in this world. So there is a lot in, in the law of Wales, right through to the fairy tradition, which follows on this culturally, it's a follow on, it relates one to the other, even though it's, it's described in different ways about proper uh, interactions with that other world. Wow, thank you both. Um, we have 11 minutes for questions. Would you like to take questions or do you want to further unpack your stories? What's your preference? I'm really happy to take stories. Daniel, do you have anything? I think I would just highlight, uh, following on from what you were saying there and what you were saying before we told the stories, um, what's mentioned in the, at the end of my story is that uh, the heroine of the story, she goes over the sea to Tirna Nog, uh, land of the ever young. Uh, this is something that's uh, mentioned a lot in the Fianna mythology. It's a place where the Tuatha Dé Danann or the fairy folk uh, went uh, over the sea after the the gales the, the Irish people came to Ireland and the fairy folk basically lost Ireland to them in the mythology and had to go elsewhere and they're depicted as going both under the land into their underground holes and over the sea so these two things kind of become kind of one of the same they're, they're, they're ways to access uh, the fairy world uh, underground into caves and over the sea but just to emphasize that when the most famous person to go over there was a Sheen, Finn McCool's son. And the reason he went over there is this uh, fairy queen comes over across to Ireland and says, I have heard of you. Your poems, your beautiful poems, your beautiful words and songs have reached even our halls in Tirna and Og. And, you know, they really got my attention. So you're going to be my husband and you're coming over there with me. Um, so what this and many other stories in this tradition say is if you want to get the attention of the other world, you really need to bring your best game. So if you want to get the attention, if you want to go out to the caves or go out somewhere and meet the other world, you need to somehow make yourself interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a gauntlet going down. <laughs> I think you two are fine. Um, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> Would there, if anybody has a question, we've got probably time for a couple. Um, if you could raise your hands electronically, if you know how to do that, or wave madly, but we've got quite a few people in tonight, so probably best if you can electronically raise a hand. And also to say, Angad, we've had a couple of requests for you to write down the name of um, the chamber in Anglesey. Um, and then you are the chat. Um, 
Yes, yeah, if you could. Okay, I'll do that. So. Ellie. Oh, hello, and uh, thank you both of you for wonderful stories. Really enjoyed that. I have a specific question for Angarad. Um, in the Mabinogi, the queen seems to be the only person who isn't named. And I was wondering if you had any ideas of why that would be. It's a really interesting question. And it's one that is particularly interesting. Do you know this story that you're yes, asking? I do. Yes. Okay. So in the story, it's left very ambiguous whether Rhiannon, who then comes from the other world on a white gleaming horse to claim um, Puyll as her husband is actually one and the same as the queen. And it's difficult, if they'd given her a name, it would make that clear. By just calling her a queen, it's less ambiguous for us to kind of ponder, I suppose, the field is left open. So that's why, um, that's why I think she's just as a queen. It's, it's also, it's one of those, um, you know, it's, it's quite rare in the Mabinogan because all the other characters, you, you know, the males and the females, there's, there's great equality. Uh, and that's one of the things the Mabinogion teaches us is that that um, when there is disharmony or imbalance between the masculine and the feminine, all hell breaks loose. Um, so it's a very kind of um, it's a very modern kind of uh, kind of sense of that equality and and keeping things in balance seems to be incredibly important. That's one of the great teachings. So I don't think it's anything to do with an oversight. I think it's quite purposeful that she's the queen and then it leaves it, leaves it field open for her to become Rhiannon, possibly, in the next part of the story. Does Thank that help much? Does anybody else have anything? If not, I'd love to ask both of you. So we've talked about integrity and balance. Are there any other common um, teachings from these stories that, sorry, that's a big question, but um, is there anything that springs to mind? There's loads. Uh, Daniel, yeah. do, you want to have a, do you want to answer before I launch in on this one? Um, I think I would need to narrow down uh, what particular branch of Scottish stories we're looking at here. If we're looking at, is there is there a branch that you, you want to talk about, Rachel, or shall I? No, not particularly, no. It's just a general, you know, what, what can we learn from these stories about the other world and how to interact with it? Um, and yeah, just principles of, of that interaction, I suppose, yeah. So from the Mabinogi, there's quite a number of things. One is integrity. Mm. You bring your best, you know, you, integrity is really important. You're really, the, the other world sees through all the chinks in your armor. There's no hiding there. Um, there's also uh, quite a lot about, you know, paying, showing respect and this sense of keeping in balance, taking and giving in balance. Um, you know, you don't take more than you give and you certainly don't take from there unless it's given to you, unless it's offered to you. Honesty is really important. And then the other thing that comes out quite strongly is things like your ethics, just because, and, and, and this is a more general one, but there's a general teaching, particularly in the fourth branch, the Mabinogion, is uh, around about the ethics of magic. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should do something. And there's a lot talked about it, about developing so personal sovereignty. That's really important. That's the, the soul's journey. Part of it is about that part of that growth that it's always talking about is about developing personal sovereignty. And through that, being able to then be in some kind of a confident balance with all other things. Um, with nature, with the other world, with the people in your life as well. 
and harmony is what's kind of is 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 the thing that every that, that it seems to be trying to bring us to there's also in the Mabinogi because one of uh, when it was written down it's possible that it was written as a guide towards manhood for a uh, a young prince called uh, Argloith Rhys or Rhys uh, ap uh, Griffith. Um, and so it's a guide to manhood put uh, using kind of ancient stories. And so there's a lot in there as well about proper kingship and the, the um, that it's not all about power. It's actually about um, honouring people around you. Um, it's about the burden that you wear as a leader. It's about being the, the leader being a bridge rather than autocrat. So there's some lots of things like that in it as well. But then later, um, as we come to the fairy tradition, and, and in the Welsh fairy tradition, we call them the Tuluith Teg, they're often in the stories described as kind of human beings being taken into the sides of hills, into these great mounds in the sides of hills. And of course, taking you back to um, Bryn Kelly the Yon Anglesey again, that's exactly what these burial chambers would have looked like during the time that the these stories were changing into fairy tales. So the idea that you would go in and out and interact with them, with the with the fairies in these ancient in mounds, was probably some kind of a remembrance of doing that with the ancestors. Wow, thank you. Um, Susie's asking which translation of the Mabinogion you would recommend, Anne Goward. Uh, I really like the, uh, the Shona Davis translation, um, only because being a storyteller, it's, she's translated it with storytellers with performance in mind, and certainly that's the tradition that it comes from. So, you know, it would have been born on the oral tradition and the storytelling tradition being handed down from tongue to ear, for as much as a thousand years or more before it was kind of captured in, into ink and on vellum uh, in the mid kind of 12th century. Um, so reclaiming some of the rhythm of story and some of the storyteller's art that, that is in that initial manuscript in the translation feels wonderful. The only thing I would say for most people, first time they come to the Mabinogi, they find it hard because there's a layer of Christianization that has crept in there when it was written down, because it was written down at Strata, Florida, um, which was a, a monastic establishment. So you've got to kind of, kind of scrape that off to get to the really juicy mythic bits underneath, but persevere, it's worth, well worth doing that. Fantastic, thank you. We've come to the end of our hour and Kate and Maria, I saw your hands and I'm so sorry you've taken them down, I assume, probably because we're running out of time. But um, yes, thank you all for coming. Um, what I would say um, is that we are going to be looking more at these portals to the other world in our um program is that the right word in in our exploration of the cave uh next year um we'll be looking at this idea of portals and caves around the world the histories the stories of them and we will be building our own cave and creating our own ceremony to see what we might see what we might hear well whilst we're in the cave and how we might use that to vision um the future. So uh, it'd be lovely to see some of you on that and I'm sure we'll do many more uh, sessions like this as part of that so hopefully um, you can come again and yeah lovely to see you all thank you so much Daniel and Anne Garrod I feel we could have gone on for hours there. Um, yes good night everybody if you want to unmute for a second just to say goodbye that'd be wonderful it'd be lovely to hear your voices. Go well, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.